I'm Tim Maudlin. I'm a professor of philosophy at, at NYU and the uh, founder and director of the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics. And I am going to just give a, a, a talk about some work I've been doing very recently within the last year. So we live in space and, and time in some sense, and space and time have some structure. And from antiquity, from at least Zeno, it's been thought that it might be that space is a continuum at, at its fundamental level, or it might be that space isn't, that it's somehow discrete or chunked up. And there was some debate about this. It was seemed immediately obvious that you couldn't tell just by offhand looking what the structure of space and time are at a fundamental level. So we can ask in particular, are space and time infinitely divisible? Now, according to Euclid, they are, because for any line segment, you can divide it in half, and then you can take the half and divide it in half, and you get an infinite number of points that way. Uh, and because of that, if you uh, have a point on a line in Euclidean geometry, there is no next point over. No matter how little you go over, you've skipped over points to get there. Um, and the same is true for directions. So you have in this image, uh, on the on the left, a line with two endpoints, and then a, a middle point, the red point, and on the right, two directions, and then the red direction that lies between them in the same way. So by the same kind of argumentation in Euclidean geometry, there are an infinite number of directions at any point, there are an infinite number of points on any line. But as I said, since antiquity, it's been considered, well, maybe that's not true. And maybe at base space and time are discrete in some way. And even so, it could appear continuous at everyday scales. And that just seems like a simple thing to understand. Your computer screen is made of pixels, it's discrete. There are a certain number of pixels that come on on a certain range of colors, but because there are so many of them at the scale you look at it, it looks continuous. It looks like, it looks like kind of you put in geometry. Um, now, if you want to have a discrete structure, and that's what I've been working on, you have to say, all right, what makes one point adjacent to another? That is, if you have one point and then literally the next one along, what gives them that relation? And in this kind of atomic geometry I've been thinking about, the answer is, well, you have atomic one-dimensional elements. So we can think of points as atomic zero dimensional elements, and then you have atomic lines, they're not made out of points. They have points as boundaries. So these things I'll call zero elements, which is just a name for points, zero dimensional elements, form the boundaries of one elements, of one dimensional elements. And adjacency is then you say one point is next to the, another if they're both boundaries of one and the same atomic line, atomic one element. Uh, and so you can have one dimensional spaces made up of these atomic points and atomic lines. Here are some examples. The one at the top is sort of what you think of a kind of infinite, an infinite one dimensional universe if you keep going in both directions or the little pentagon would be a closed kind of spatial universe or it could even branch off in that way. So that's one way to think about building up discrete structures. Now, what I've been developing, which I call full discrete geometry, has atomic elements of this sort of every dimensionality up to the dimensionality of the space. So you've got zero elements that are points, one, one elements that are one dimensional atomic lines, two elements that are two dimensional atomic surfaces, and they're bounded by one elements, three elements, which are atomic volumes, they're bounded by two elements, and so on. You could keep going if you wanted to. As far as we can tell, the space we live in is three-dimensional, so we don't need to go above that. So that's the basic idea. But once you have the basic idea, there are just lots of ways to realize it. You have to make choices. Um, the most common choice of physicists who think about this is to use what are called simplexes. Once you get up to two dimensions and three dimensions and so on, a simplex is the simplest kind of object of that dimensionality. So a two-dimensional simplex, the simplest two-dimensional structure is a triangle. And 
a three-dimensional simplex, the simplest three-dimensional structure of this sort is a, is a tetrahedron. And you can keep going up if you want to go up in higher dimensions. So that's what's normally done. Um, that's not what I've been doing. Uh, I've been thinking in a different way that's a bit associated back to Euclid. So you think of a one-dimensional element, a point, a, 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 sorry, a zero-dimensional element, a point, a zero element. If it moves in some direction, it traces out a line, a one-dimensional element. And if we take that line and then move it in some other direction, move the whole line in another direction, that will trace out a two-dimensional element, but it'll sort of be a quadrilateral. And if I take that quadrilateral and move it in yet another direction, another dimension, that'll trace out something that looks like a cube, more or less, a, a square-based prism. So here, visually, you can see what I'm talking about. The zero element is the line. If I move it, I get a one element. If I move the one element, I get a two element that has these four bounding edges. And if I move the two element down, I get a three element like that. And you should think again, that the, the larger dimensional elements are not made of points. The, the, the only points there are, are the ones indicated. So uh, in the three element, there are eight of them and they form the vertices, but that's all there are. Good. So, if we want to now build a model of space using this, we have to figure out how these elements are stuck together in order to make our space. And I'm going to talk through almost all of this talk about two-dimensional space, just because it's easier and it's easier to picture and easier to draw pictures of, but everything would go over pretty much without change into three-dimensional space. Uh, and so, well, how do I make an obvious two-dimensional space out of my atomic elements? The obvious thing to do is to, to do what you get from tiling a Euclidean plane with squares or quadrilaterals. That is, you get something like this two space. So you've got a finite number of points there. There are the yellow dots. You have a finite number of lines. They're the things that connect the dots. You have a finite number of uh, two-dimensional elements, two elements. There are 25 of them in this space. And that's, that's the geometry of it. Could the space we live in be like that? So that's the question we want to ask. Now, the first thing to notice is that these discrete spaces have a natural kind of intrinsic geometry to them. Because they're discrete, there are only finitely many elements if the space itself is finite. So we saw in the, in the space I just showed you, there are only 25 uh, two elements, only 25 of these squares and uh, 36 zero elements and so on. You can just count them. And so there's a natural way to define something like a geometry. Uh, if I want to define the distance between one point and another, between one zero element and another, the natural thing to do is to find the shortest continuous path that connects them. A continuous path would be starting from this one, uh, then you go along a one element to its boundary, then to another, then to another, and you just count how many jumps it takes at a minimum to get from here to there. And if you do that, that gives you what's generally called taxicab geometry for the obvious reasons. So this should be something everybody can understand. Here's my two space. Um, the distance between the two red dots is the shortest continuous path that connects them, which consists of three one elements, three little lines. So you could say that distance is three. And the distance between the two blue dots is the shortest continuous path that connects them. And that turns out to be a distance of eight, but it, it's no longer unique what the shortest path is. There are lots of paths of length eight that will get you from the one dot to the other. So if you start at the bottom, you could go up five and then over three, or you could go over three and then up five, or you could go up and over and up two and over and sort of zigzag your way up. But the shortest path will be eight units long. So that gives us a kind of sense of distance in this space. And it's the natural one you would attribute to it. Now, the thing to notice about this 
intrinsic geometry is that it doesn't look like Euclidean geometry at all. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.